So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor H.P. Tan. H.P. Uh, works at the Singapore Management University, where he has been since March 2015. Uh, he leads a very interesting team. Uh, so it, he's not just focusing on IoT technologies, but he's also got social uh, science researchers in his team. So it's a nice sort of coming together of two fields. And they're doing some very interesting work in how to deal with uh, aging uh, in, in place, right? It's a very topical issue, right? I mean, all of us are getting older. And though we might say the 30s are the new 20s, 40s are the new 30s, and whatever, eventually our bodies are going to say, hey, you're getting old, right? So I think it's a very interesting topic. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, some of the insights that HP has to offer. Uh, it, there's a very detailed bio uh, in the program here. I won't go through the entire bio, uh, but I'll just give you the highlights. So before HP joined SMU, he was at uh, ASTAR, uh, the, particularly the Institute for Infocom Research at ASTAR, where he led a program on uh, sensing and uh, sensor networks, essentially. And uh, he got his uh, degree, PhD degree from uh, Technion in Israel. He spent some time in uh, Ireland, in uh, Netherlands, so he's been working in different parts of the world. Uh, so yeah, please join me in welcoming HP. Uh, thank, thank you, Sabir. And uh, before I begin, I'd like first to thank the organizers of Sensei for uh, the kind invitation to share um, this talk this afternoon. Um, so, um, in this presentation, I would just like to share with you some of the experiences that we have from some real-world large-scale IoT deployments, specifically for uh, to support aging in place. And these are uh, this project is still ongoing with, um, for the last close to three years. Um, but before I begin, I first also like to introduce my lab. So um, in SMU, besides teaching. I also direct a lab that is called the ICT Lab. So this lab is actually co-funded by Tata Consultancy Services. Um, the lab has been around for more than six years. Uh, so obviously we've been, I think, doing reasonably well. That's why we're still around. Um, it was started in August 2011 um, because Tata wanted uh, to establish a co-innovation lab with an academic institution to focus on the area of intelligent cities, which now, of course, has evolved to become smart cities, as you know it. Um, and um, the idea, besides intelligent, is also intended uh, to to be to mean integrated, inclusive, and innovative. Uh, so, why the TCS SMU partnership? Um, you probably are familiar with who TCS is. Uh, they are. They have a strong track record in executing large transformational projects for governments, and of course, they have many innovation labs in India that looks at various areas such as mobile, big data, and IoT. Um, Singapore Management University is a relatively young university. Uh, we are the only city city campus in Singapore, uh, so our strength, being a young university, is that we're able to integrate computing management and social sciences um, and have acquired some expertise, multidisciplinary expertise on smart city solutions. Uh, and being in the city makes us ideal also for conducting pilots. Um, so we are in the third phase of the lab. So in the beginning, uh, basically Tata Consultancy Services gave us a blank check and say, can you broadly look into the area of intelligent cities uh, but instead of focusing on an infrastructure approach, can you do a more software-centric approach, citizen-centric approach? Um, so we started um, looking at uh, services, creating citizen-centric services for communities with special needs. So this was before the time I joined the lab, so I, don't, I won't say too much about it. Um, and then in the second phase, which started in 2014 up till uh, July this year, we went uh, really strongly into the area of aging, uh, the application of Internet of Things technologies, but applying it through the lens of social behavioral lens. This is important because um, we want the users to adopt 
the solutions and we also want the solutions to be sustainable. Um, and the projects that we have, um, we have also government agency partners involved, um, technological partners, and uh, very importantly, on the ground partners such as caregiving organizations or what you may know as NGOs. Um, in the third phase, of course, this is still quite an unknown. But we are moving into the third phase. Um, the second phase, we focus primarily on citizens as consumers of services. So another interesting area that TCS is interested to look at would be citizens as also producers of services. Or um, you, may, you may be familiar with the term open or sharing economy. Okay, um, so this talk is specifically about the use of technology to meet the needs of elderly people or seniors. So um, I don't have to explain to you the fact that um, the world population is aging, especially in developed cities. Uh, I'm sure in a few years, developing cities will also face this aging problem. Uh, Singapore is already in the status of aged uh, society, uh, but we're not yet super aged like Japan is today. Um, but amongst the aging population, so aging as of today refers to 65 and above, but I think this, this number is going to get bigger as 65 year olds will become the new, the young new, the young old, yeah, as uh, Salio has rightly pointed out. So amongst this group of seniors, our particular interest was in seniors who live alone. Um, why seniors who live alone? Because uh, research has shown that this group um, is twice more vulnerable to die prematurely, twice more likely to get depressed compared to those who do not live alone. Um, and in Singapore, while well, we have about 40, just over 40,000 seniors who live alone today, in less than 15 years, this number will double to 83,000. So something that uh, Singapore is uh, seriously looking at. Um, so seniors who live alone, they may not have family or they have family members who live quite far away. So in order for them to feel safe, and to have their well-being, either physical or social well-being, maintained at a proper level, they need to rely on support from their community. So, um, if I look at this from the perspective of a, a person who lives alone, so suppose I am this uncle uh, who lives alone, so what would be my wish list for technologies? If I want these technologies to help me age in place, so of course the technologies must be non-intrusive. I don't want them to be to know when I'm taking a shower, when I'm changing clothes, um, and it has it does, it should not change my daily habits. So if I have a certain way of life today, I, the technologies cannot force me to adopt a different way of life. Uh, but very importantly, these technologies must be able to better enable person-centric community care. So community care here refers to care that you can receive in your vicinity, in where you live, uh, not from far away uh, family members or next of kid. Person-centric care means that the care cannot be a one-size-fits-all, so because uh, all seniors, just like all of us, we have different needs, so you only want the care to come to you when you need it, and not to come to you when you don't need it. So specifically, we are looking at, in this project, we're looking at three things. So safety needs is, for instance, when you are in defense of stress, like if you have heart palpitations or if you faint or fall. So somehow the technology must be able to detect this, trigger help that can come to you as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so these are event-based. But beyond that, because the technologies in the home already collect a rich data set, you also want to somehow mine this data set so that you can link this data set to the physical and the social well-being of the seniors, so that before anything happens, you can already detect that something is about to happen and trigger care. So what this means is that the person does not have to end up in the hospital, so maybe some intervention could happen, and that would be a big help um, in terms of the limited healthcare resources that uh, the whole world is facing. Um, Another thing that is important to bear in mind is that we talk a lot about seniors, but uh, ultimately the technologies that we develop, um, the, use, the users of these technologies are not the seniors themselves. So the seniors benefit from it, 
But the users of this technology platform are the caregivers on the ground. So think about caregivers who are not people like myself and yourself who are tech savvy. Most social workers and people who work in NGOs are not extremely tech savvy. Uh, just to give an example of um, their needs. Um, so one of our partners, uh, so this is a data from Google Maps. One of our partners, uh, NGOs, run a senior activity center. Um, and they look after seniors uh, who live in three apartment blocks. And there are a total of 540 people that they look after, and all these seniors live alone. Um, rental flats in Singapore means that you are likely to be in the bottom 20% in terms of your social economic level. So you have either no income or less than $500 a month, and depending on government subsidy for your day-to-day -day expenses. Um, the Senior Activity Center has four full-time staff, depends on 10 active volunteers, all of whom are seniors themselves, so they are slightly more active and healthier than the others. And out of the 540 seniors, they have 280 of them are active at the activity center. So you would see these seniors appearing in the center. The other 260 probably stays at home for most of the time for whatever reasons. So four staff to 280 seniors. And this is in-center activities. So when we provide, equip them with the technology, it could be an additional burden to their day-to-day -day operational work that they run activities in the center. So uh, with this in mind, if again I put myself in the perspective of a caregiver who runs activities at the center, um, I just basically want the system not to flood me with information, but only to tell me uh, about specific seniors when they need help, and when they need help, what is it that they need help in? Is it physically, is it the social well-being, and so on. So these are my expectations, so that in, the, in addition to running the center, I can also provide timely assistance as needed by the seniors who are not in the center at the moment. So, um, but to complete the equation, uh, if you want such a platform to be truly scalable and sustainable, besides the technology perspective, besides the user's perspective, uh, you also need to consider, uh, for instance, now we are a government-funded project. Beyond the project, somebody, if this proves to be useful, a company, a spin-off, a startup, has to take this on. And if I was running a startup like this, uh, I have some expectations, for instance, I would want to be able to maximize the system's reliability so that I can minimize the need for maintenance. Now, why is this? First, of course, I can't, I can't afford to keep 10 maintenance engineers in my team, right, probably one or two. And at the same time, each time I do maintenance, I have to disturb the seniors, I have to schedule an appointment. So these are very important from my perspective. Um, and then from three other government agencies' perspective, if I was a town planner, uh, so in Singapore we call them the, the authority agency, it's called Urban Free Development Authority, um, I want to know whether with such technologies at the community level, um, are our communities age friendly so that our seniors can age in place? From the Ministry of Health perspective, um, if I was in the aging planning office, I would want your project to show me evidence that data-driven community care can improve the well-being of seniors um, through both reactive and preventive care. So reactive means reactive to events. Preventing, preventing, means preventing, uh, triggering care uh, before the health deteriorates to, uh, to, to become an actual event of stress. Uh, last but not least, so the housing development boards are the people who build these uh, apartments or flats. Um, right now, of course, we retrofit the flats with these sensors. Um, for this to be truly safe, scalable, it ideally should be part of the new flats that the government will build. But for them to agree to incorporate this as built in, they also need to know whether the cost of the system is economically viable. And of course, whether it's useful to have these kind of monitoring technologies in the home. Okay, so in a nutshell, what we have developed, what we call it a data-driven community, elder care platform. Um, the, the components of the platform are in the middle. So all these are our key stakeholders in our projects. So we have the government agencies, 
we have the beneficiaries who are community dwelling seniors who live alone. Um, apart from ourselves, Tata Consultancy, we also work with, collaborate with ASTAR. And finally, um, we, in terms of the caregiving, uh, community care enablers, we work with NGOs as well as the regional health groups. Okay, in terms of data collection, um, we look at three types of uh, data. So following the typical social science research, we do psychosocial surveys. So uh, these are done periodically once every quarter. And each such survey with a senior takes about three hours. So we cannot afford to do this very regularly. It's very tiring. So from these surveys, we're able to derive some form of well-being of the seniors. We can understand what is their mobility level, whether they are ambulant or whether they are dependent on wheelchairs, uh, what's their daily routine, and so on, what's their social network. Um, apart from that, in my team, we also have two research assistants. So these are non-technical folks. They basically serve as our social workers. Their role in the project is to visit the seniors every two weeks. Uh, why do we do that? Because we want to sniff out uh, unusual events that happen to the seniors. For example, have there been any hospitalization visits to the clinics, dizzy spells, change in their routines, and so on. And last but not least, of course, uh, so in terms of uh, resolution of data, we have continuous 24 by 7 IoT data collected from sensors installed in the homes, from which we can derive uh, useful features like the following list. Uh, so based on these three types of data, we put them together in order to trigger care. Um, so this is how a typical installation of the sensors in the homes look like. Um, most of our seniors live in a two-room flat or a one-bedroom apartment. So you have sensors installed in each zone of the flat. This is the kitchen, um, the bathroom, uh, the living room, uh, the bedroom, and on the main door, there is a door contact sensor. So combining this with the motion sensors, we are able to know whether the seniors are at home or not, and how much time they spend in each part of the flat, and how much movement they have when they are in the flat. Uh, the seniors are also given a help button that they wear around, that's on a lanyard that they're supposed to wear around the neck. So they press it when they need help. Uh, but of course, 90% of them don't wear it around the neck. You know, but this is human behavior. Um, and some of the seniors, we also monitor their medication intake. We give them a very low cost box that's uh, sensorized. So it's based on the contact sensor. So we infer their medication intake when they open, each time they open and close the box. So we talk a little bit more about this. So, this is to share with you uh, our somewhat painful experience in this project. So back in early 2015 when we started this project, there was a lot of pressure from our government ministry. Uh, well, you know, government ministers, ministries tend to trivialize technologies. They'll say, these smart home technologies are already available in the market. Deploy 50 homes in three months, right? Because you don't need to develop sensors, just use off the shelf. So we work with a vendor that I shall not name. Uh, so I call this vendor if uh, we deploy in-home monitoring systems. Um, so th for this particular vendor, they have a system where all the components are built in-house. And they rely on proprietary communications technology. So they don't use open standards, uh, IEEE standards. Uh, but the worst thing of all is that their backhaul relies on the legacy 2G system. So I don't know whether you're aware, some of you may have faced problems bringing our 2G phones to Singapore because we turned off our 2G network in April this year. So um, what happened with this particular vendor was that they were trying to cope with upgrading the system from 2G to 3G. And uh, unfortunately, they faced a lot of issues. Um, another important feature that they were lacking is that the help button that is issued with the seniors doesn't come with an acknowledgement. So imagine if you are a 70 year old senior, you're in pain, you press the button, and there's no way for you to know whether your signals got through, right? So then you will press it a thousand times. 
and the more you panic, the more you press. Uh, so in year two of the project, uh, we decided to look for another vendor. Uh, so this is vendor B. Um, so comparing between vendor A and vendor B, um, they still rely on a proprietary gateway device that they built in-house. So I forgot to mention, every unit has a gateway in the home to aggregate information from the sensors. And the gateway is the, the point with the internet connectivity. So the gateway is mains powered, while the sensors are battery powered. Uh, so the difference between these two systems are that now these guys use off-the-shelf sensors that rely on Z-Wave technology. So those, some of you may be familiar with Z-Wave runs on, on, on. Um, So the good thing about this vendor compared to the first vendor is that it's more extensible. With the first vendor, when we said, can you bring us a sensor that and we can use for a medication box? So they said, okay, a thousand dollars a home. Ridiculous, right? So whereas with vendor B, we can just introduce sensors in as long as they conform to Z-Wave. So the cost significantly reduced. Um, unfortunately, the sad thing is that, so this is how the gateway looks like. Uh, beautiful UI. Uh, has a, swim, a fish that swims left and right all day. All day. Um, you may find this appealing, right? Because you interact with this device, but you have to realize that our seniors don't interact with the device. Uh, most of our seniors are illiterate or they haven't been to school. So when they see a gateway device like this, uh, with the lights nominally on and the fish going left and right, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's the cost. So lights means energy usage. It means increase in my utility bills. So what do they do? They turn off the gateways to save electricity. And of course, the gateway is our bottleneck. And once you turn that off, you have no data from the home. So, um, so painfully, in the third year of our project, we had to give up on our two vendors. So we tried to learn from what were useful. Uh, we switched, so we maintained Z-Wave uh, because they are commercially available sensors. But we replaced the gateway with a simple Raspberry Pi based gateway. Um, the benefits of this is that now the entire system is fully under control and um, everything is based on open standards. So anytime we want to add sensors, it's done at cost. Um, we've also provided the seniors with a help button that has a blinking light on the button. So each time you press it, and if the signal has gone through, uh, the light will blink. So at least the seniors will feel relieved that you know at least there is some form of acknowledgement. Uh, but uh, another important point is that by having full control of the system, we now have full capabilities of system monitoring. So with the prior vendor systems, each time a failure or fraud happens, um, it could take a long time for them to respond, or they could be hiding some information from you that you have no control of, especially with regards to the system monitoring. So this, moving on to this allows us to have full system monitoring capabilities. So when something fails, we are able to do full root cause diagnosis. So this is just to illustrate to you the importance of senior uh, centric design. Um, by having full system monitoring, we can maximize the uptime and therefore make you know, minimize the disturbance to their lives. And at the same time, when the system is reliable, the perception by the seniors and the caregivers becomes positive and they will develop depend dependability of the system, meaning that they will more likely use the system. If the system is unreliable, after a while they probably will give it up and then we will no longer uh, be able to demonstrate that this is useful. Um, so this is the user interface that's originally presented by the first two vendors. So um, this is each of the areas in the home. Each of these colored lines represent an activity. So this corresponds to one senior. And uh, the vendor systems come with a mobile app. Um, so when an alert is generated because of stressful events and so on, it contains um, the date and time, the name of the resident, and the address. Um, 
But if you think about it, if you work in the center, this is for one senior. So if you want to know what what is the status of each senior, you have to scroll through 50 of these visualizations and try and make sense of this raw data, uh, which is not easy to do. So um, this visualization of data in raw form is not very actionable. And after a while, it results in fatigue in the caregivers and they stop looking at the data. So we must be able to somehow convert this into something that is more actionable. So instead of having the um, social workers to have to scroll through this 50 seniors data every day, you just push information to them when they need to attend to a certain specific senior. And um, the other thing about this mobile app is that um, when something like this happens and the caregiver wants to know, find out more, for instance, when alert, an alert is triggered, where was the senior at home, which part of the home was he or she when it was triggered, then they have to do many, many scrolls and try and figure out where was the last motion that was detected. So this was again very painful. So, um, so in a nutshell, uh, there are two parts of this talk. So the system is supposed to collect data that is able to meet the safety and physical health needs. So this is what I term reactive care. So reactive to specific events. So these events can be, for example, not taking your medication. Uh, for instance, if you are out of home for too long, for example, if you have dementia, it's important that we pick up that you have been away of, from home longer than usual and we can trigger the caregivers. Uh, prolonged inactivity at the door, so there has been no door activity. It could mean that you have fainted at home, so you never left home, so the door was never open. Uh, prolonged inactivity in the home, so the motion sensors didn't pick up activity uh, for a long time while the senior is still at home. Or prolonged duration in each zone. For example, the senior went to the bathroom at the stick and then stayed in the bathroom. So that would constitute prolonged duration in the bathroom. So um, we will have rules that are developed that are person-centric. So depending on the senior's existing habits, we create rules together with the caregivers. And each time the rules are activated, uh, for specific activities, we will trigger an alert, and then the caregivers has a certain care and response protocol. So they could activate the staff from and the centers to attend to the seniors, or the staff could activate volunteers uh, who are seniors themselves to attend to other seniors. Um, then we have a system also to lock down the actions that are taken, so that we can evaluate uh, whether such a system has been useful um, towards the well-being of the seniors. Um, so one example here to balance the needs between the seniors and the caregivers is this topic of prolonged inactivity or dwell time at home. So um, as I said earlier, the motion sensors together with the dog contact allows you to track prolonged inactivity at home. So the senior is at home, but the motion sensors has not picked up any motion. So this could mean that the senior has fainted or fallen. But of course, it could also mean that the senior has fallen asleep and dozed off in the living room and actually nothing has happened. But the system can't tell the difference. So um, but of course, we want to be safe. We want to detect this. So sometimes it could be a real emergency. Sometimes it could be a false positive. Um, so what, how long should we set this threshold before the alarm is triggered? Should it be one hour or should it be eight hours? So the setting of this threshold would of course make the seniors or the caregivers caregivers happy or happy. If the threshold is set very low, so say I set it at one hour, it means that if something does happen to me, within one hour the system will pick it up and somebody will come and knock on the door. So if I'm the senior, of course I'll feel happy. Uh, but if I'm the caregiver, one hour setting of threshold could mean that there will be a dozen of false alarms, alerts that are sent to my phone. I'll call the seniors and I notice, oh, actually the senior is okay, he's just dozed off. Or he sits very still in the living room watching TV. So um, that could cause a lot of fatigue to the caregivers. You know, it's like a, a wolf drawing. 
uh, on the other extreme, of course, if we set it to eight hours, um, the seniors might find this to be not very dependable because if I faint, and it takes you eight hours to detect that I faint, you know, I, I might have died during the eight hours. Not very helpful. Uh, but if you set it eight hours, likely there will be no false positive, so the technicals of course be helpful. So how do we try, how do we set this correct threshold for different seniors uh, to meet their individual needs and also the caregivers' needs? Uh, so we look at the historical activity data of each senior. So this really depends on their mobility status and how much they move within the house. And at the same time, we also try to look at information that's picked up by the survey and the ad hoc observations. So here is an example of two different alert settings for two seniors. So they are in the same age group, they are both in their early 80s. Uh, they both suffer from the usual chronic conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. Um, but for this auntie Tan, uh, her threshold was set at three hours based on combining the inactivity data for <coughs> this information. So this particular auntie is not very sociable. She stays home most of the time, and she's frail and has a history of fall. So she is more at risk. Therefore, we set the threshold to be at three hours. Um, for another auntie, Auntie Chan, the threshold was set at six hours because she has a very active routine. She gets up at 4.30 to go for exercise every day, generally fit and she socializes a lot with the neighbors. So in this case, she is less at risk and therefore we can afford to set the threshold to be at six hours. So we look at the aggregate. So what's the aggregate effect of this personalization of the alert thresholds? Um, this is done over for 50 seniors. Um, so this is prior to personalization. So we wanted to, to be safe. We set the thresholds originally to eight hours. Um, so we recorded down the actual false alarms. And then after that, we did personalization in the end of 2015. And we observed the effects um, in terms of the thresholds as well as the false alarm rates over the whole year period. So here you can see from 8 hours we managed to set it to 5.7 during the daytime and 4.9 on average during the night time. So these are average figures meaning that some seniors could have these settings at 2 hours, some of them could have them at 8 hours. Um, and if we compare the false alarm rates, this is of course lower than this to be expected. Um, 5.3 per month was tolerable because we told the caregivers there is uh, no such thing as zero false alarms. So you have to give us a target for which we can work towards. So they said, okay, our, our staff can tolerate up to seven false alarms per month. So we were within the target of seven. So as you can see, we were able to reduce the threshold level. So of course this makes the seniors more happy. And keeping the false alarm rates to within the set allowable level. Um, some other things we tried to deliver to the caregivers. So working in this project has its challenges, one of which is a lot of times the caregivers don't know what they want. So as computer scientists, we have to speculate. We think, okay, we think this might be useful to you. So we generated two things. So one is the prolonged bathroom usage data. The other one is the prolonged kitchen usage. So what these charts here show you is like a leaderboard. So it shows every day, end of the day, a top five um, seniors where the duration in the bathroom during that, the maximum duration exceeded that senior's average bathroom duration. So we thought, you know, you might find this interesting and actionable, right, because they have unusual bathroom or kitchen durations. Uh, so this went on, this was sent as, as an email on a daily basis. Um, but after one month, unfortunately, the caregivers didn't know what to do with this information. So we stopped sending them these emails because it was not leading to any action. Okay, I'll move on to um, medication monitoring. So as we know, in, I mean, especially among seniors, most seniors are on daily medication, at least one to or polymorphic. Um, and if they don't comply to the medication, it could lead, lead to adverse health complications. Um, 
So some of you may have come across commercially available pill boxes. So there are those tiny little ones with a lot of lights, looks very smart and savvy. Um, we actually surveyed those and we decided that they will not be usable by our seniors. So I don't know whether the medication habits from where you come from is the same as what we have in this part of the world. So most of our hospitals and clinics dispense medication to the seniors in three monthly doses or four monthly doses. So they come in a big plastic bag. So in most of the seniors in our study, they take medication directly from these plastic bags. So in big plastic bags. And this is their current habit. So if you think about usability, if you push a tiny pill box to them, um, and we tried that, uh, they wouldn't use it. So if they don't use it, you collect no, no data. Um, but we know that we want to monitor their information so that we can trigger care. Um, these are some key results that we obtained from a survey from our senior participants, just to justify the importance of having this real-time monitoring. Um, close to 90% of seniors are on daily medication. Most of them don't have packing assistance from nurses and so on. And uh, majority of them store their medication in plastic bags or containers. So this is how they look like in real life. Um, so what we did was that we went on to buy very cheap boxes. They cost only two dollars from the store. We have this uh, cheap store called Daiso in Singapore. We have them where you come from. Um, so we gave them these boxes. We also told them uh, we could give you a box like this, or we could give you drawers with three drawers, so you could have morning, afternoon, and evening. Or if you have two doses, you can keep the third drawer for your snacks. And they love it, because this is additional storage space. And furthermore, we gave them a choice of colors, and this really matters, because they really choose the colors. Because if you want to use them, it's important. So we, have a, we dispense these boxes, and we have a contact sensor that measures that uh, triggers each time they open the box. This information is collected by a gateway in the home, uh, sent to the cloud. So again, we this the design of the sensor front end also evolved. Uh, initially, these were our design choices. Uh, if you ask me why did we use this, um, so before I joined, I was from A Star, and these were things we were familiar with, and we used this in our project. Simple as that. There's no other better explanation. Familiarity. I'm sure some of you might be guilty of this as well. Uh, and then, but we found that this system was not very reliable. We had to replace the batteries very frequently. And uh, more importantly, this one runs on a bigger bone. And that means some of the seniors' homes have got two gateways in their homes. One by the vendor, and the second one by our medication monitoring. So a lot of devices that you have to use power. And again, power means money. So we evolved this to a Raspberry Pi based gateway. So now you understand why we use the Raspberry Pi. So now those seniors with medication box and the motion sensors only needs to have one gateway installed in their box instead of two previously. Um, and we use the same Z-Wave based door contact sensor as we use on the main door of the seniors' apartment. Um, and comparing these two, we realized this to be more stable, less frequent battery replacements, only one gateway device that draws power from the home. Um, these are some of the charts that we plotted. So this is data that we collected from 15 seniors who was on our medication study. Um, so each box corresponds to one senior. Um, if to interpret this, the x-axis is the month, and the y-axis is the frequency of intake. So uh, these are box meaning that ideally, if you want them to have regular behavior, you should see a thin line like this. So if you see a thick box, it means that the medication intake is highly variant, which is not good. Um, so if you can see from this chart, only two out of the 15 are quite regular. So most of them are quite irregular in terms of their medication habits. So, uh, so what do we do with the data? Uh, so the real-time monitoring data comes in. And basically, we want to see whether we can classify the seniors into adhering and non-adhering. 
So this classification could be in terms of the frequency of intake and also timing of intake. So are you conforming to your timings that you're supposed to take? Are you conforming to the number of times you take medication? So we, this chart shows a cluster plot of the timing. So for this particular senior, most of the, so some of the, there are two dominant timings, and then there are other timings as well. Um, this one shows the same data, but um, showing the intake frequency. So this is what is declared, and these are frequencies that are above and beyond. So again, some learnings from these charts. I think these charts um, look complex enough and they are meaningful to us. Um, but when we presented these charts to the caregivers, they actually have no idea how to interpret this because it looks too complicated. So what was eventually useful was a calendar plot. So they love this because this is like your calendar and each of these blocks has a number. So each of these numbers represents the number of intake for that particular day. So this is the month and this is the day of the month. So this becomes easy to read because green means you're okay and the closer you are to red means you're not okay. So based on this, again, we can create the rules uh, and these rules are generated by the caregivers because they, the seniors are their beneficiaries. For instance, for this senior, they could say, if the senior has Parkinson's, they would say it's very serious if he misses the medication. So each day that he misses the medication, send us an alert. You could have another senior who is quite stable. So if he misses one day, no big deal. Misses two days, no big deal. If he misses three consecutive days, send us an alert. So these rules are provided for different seniors depending on their conditions. And so this is how a, the first version of the message looks like. So basically, the information about the senior, the dates, the time, whether it's a full mess and so on. And it also logs the action taken by the caregiver. So if you see this information, what do you do? Do you call the seniors and then you find out whether they missed it because they were hospitalized, they missed it because uh, there were some issues with our sensor system, and so on. So again, this particular CAN response platform uh, also evolved. Initially, we used an SMS system. So uh, an SMS like this is triggered and sent to caregivers. And we realized that uh, the caregivers found this SMS system to be not useful because it is a one-to-one -one system. When I can, while well, I can broadcast SMS to many recipients, but I wouldn't know who had responded and taken action, right? Because then the caregivers will have to move to a WhatsApp group that they currently have, discuss the case, and then somebody will reply the SMS. So this is not very efficient, <coughs> especially when it is collaborative caregiving. So we evolved this system to a many-to-many uh, -many messaging system, uh, something like WhatsApp chat group, but this is called Slack. So this is an enterprise software that functions in a similar way as WhatsApp, but this is targeted to work teams. So now uh, we can create a channel uh, for this particular caregiving organization, and alerts are generated in this channel that can be received by all the members of this group. And within this channel, the members can then even discuss within the same chat channel, and then take, decide collectively to take action. And this system also allows us to block automatically the actions that are taken. Um, another lesson learned, this is the caregiver notification interface. Uh, so I'll talk about mobile app A, of course belonging to vendor A, mobile app B belonging to vendor B. Uh, so I don't know why there is an obsession of mobile app development because I personally hate mobile apps. Because each time you buy something, it comes with mobile apps. So you plug and you plug your phone with mobile apps that you don't use. Um, so the first mobile app, as I said earlier, it's difficult to navigate from alerts to resident activity. And in fact, uh, mobile development is very heavily dependent. Their performance is heavily dependent on the OS and the device. So while it may work on a Samsung S7, it may not work on other Android devices. So this is very unpredictable. 
And because of that, we have basic alert deliveries. Imagine when a senior presses the help button, needs help, and the alert doesn't come through because of the system failure. So this is quite critical. Um, the second mobile app, I think, again, this it looks something like that. It is in target. This is intended for you and me. So you love to consume a lot of information. So their app comprises a lot of information, like it notifies you each time the senior walks into the kitchen, and then when he walks into the bedroom, he sends you a message. So imagine you are a caregiver. I mean, what do you want to know each time he walks into the bedroom and then he walks into the kitchen? It's a, a lot of unactionable information. Uh, so eventually, we replaced the mobile apps, and we just rely on over-the-top messaging. Uh, because ultimately, the caregivers, what do they really want? They just want to be notified when something happens. And in that notification message, you give them as much information as possible. For example, if an, the button is pressed, where was the location of the senior when the button was pressed? And you could even provide information like when was the last time he pressed the button, and so on. So this is enough information for the caregivers to know what actions to take compared to navigating through the mobile apps. So uh, importantly, because our caregivers are our primary users, uh, the design of these has to be caregiver-centric. So it has to complement their job instead of burdening them. And ease of use is important and when needed use. So they don't need to see the screen when nothing happens. Right? Only when something needs their assistance. Um, to show you some case studies that monitoring and then the intervention that's derived from the data does help. I can't say that it helps all our seniors. So for medication study, we have found two seniors where at least uh, the system helped um, so this particular case, this data corresponds to a senior who is in her early 60s. Uh, she is wheelchair bound. She consumes five types of medications five times a day. And uh, her primary caregiver is a doctor who, lives with her, who administers the medication. So we started monitoring her in July 2016. And we noticed that there was some, initially there were some irregular medication. See? Uh, three times, six times, three times, four times, and so on. So ideally, it should be five times and exactly five times. So um, presented in a box plot is much clearer. So you can see the first few months of monitoring, the behavior was quite irregular. So what happened here that made it regular? So the caregivers actually did intervention at the end of September. So they went to visit the senior and they did some medication reconciliation. So what happened was that they found out the living daughter has a below average intelligence. So she had difficulty coping with the mother's complicated medi medication regime. So the caregivers found a different way of educating her on dispensing medication. And then afterwards, we, we did see that it did help in making her mother's medication pattern more regular. So I could say that Without collecting this data, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't have been able to find out this information like that and provide the proper care and intervention. Um, okay, let me move on to preventive care. So I've talked a lot about event-driven care. So when something has happened, like you miss medication or you have fallen, fainted, and so on. So let's take a look at uh, how we can use the same data that we've collected to do preventive care. So for instance, from the same data set, we can derive some of these uh, sensor features. And we have found a way to find correlations. If we can find a way to find, identify and determine correlations between these and well-being indices. So well-being indices are computed from the psychosocial survey. So from the survey, we are able to determine the senior's level of loneliness their level of physical frailty, uh, their level of cognitive well-being, and so on. So if we are able to somewhat link this to, what this means in the future could be, um, as you know, doing surveys is very labor-intensive because you need somebody to visit the senior. It's intensive for the interviewer. It's intensive for the senior. So it's not very sustainable. And you can only do it 
as infrequently as possible. If we can link this to what it means is that if we have the info monitoring system, we could potentially do early detection of certain deterioration in well-being if there is correlation found between the sensor features and the well-being of the system. And what this means could mean that uh, early intervention could be accorded and we could prevent uh, the need for the seniors to go to the hospital. So we started with the area of social isolation. Um, this table shows you some results that we got from 50 seniors and after analyzing two years worth of data. So the first column here shows you the features that are derived from the census. And the other four columns are numbers that are collected from the psychosocial survey. So we did a correlation analysis and what we want ideally is that the p-values that are in brackets to be as small as possible, so less than 0 0.05. This would mean that a sensor, particular sensor feature is significantly correlated with a specific well-being index. So here we can see, for example, average daily away duration. So the amount of time that the senior spends out of home shows correlation with social loneliness, social network, and therefore social isolation score, which is computed from these three indices. So um, this is shown here, for instance, um, daily away when as the, if the senior goes up more, the likelihood of social isolation is less. So this is actually quite intuitive as we would have expected. Uh, but beyond that, we also found that uh, the napping duration during the day, the time spent in the living room are also correlated with social isolation dimension. So the more time you spend in the living room watching TV, uh, indicates that you are probably at risk of being socially isolated. So what we did was this result was that again we shared this with our caregiving partners. Out of 50, 50 seniors, we identified seven that we think are at risk of high levels of social isolation. So at least for the benefit for the caregivers are that these seniors are the ones who tend not to appear at the activity centers. So they have no clue about the physical well-being of these seniors. So at least now we are able to put these seniors in the radar of the, caregiving, the caregivers so that they can do more targeted intervention. Um, should I do a time check to determine how much? Okay. Um, so very quickly, um, on a similar topic, so earlier we talked about social isolation. So we have another project where we look at, we were trying to connect between sensor features and cognitive impairment in seniors who live alone. So in this particular project, we deployed uh, a lot more sensors, as you can see from this picture. So beyond the motion sensors and the dog contact sensor in the medication box, uh, we gave these seniors a bed sensor, uh, a smart plug to monitor their TV watching activity, um, beacons, so these beacons are attached to their keychains and all their handbags. So these are items that they are supposed to remember to bring out when they leave home. And also a smartwatch that tracks your steps and your heart rate and so on. So what we want to derive are these features. Uh, and the primary feature that we want to derive is forgetfulness. So for this project, we work with a clinical psychiatrist. And from her clinical experience, most seniors who suffer from mild cognitive impairment demonstrates forgetfulness in bringing these personal items like keys and wallets. Um, again, the intention for this project is early detection. If forgetfulness can be determined by beacons, it means that um, we can then detect early when a senior degrades from cognitively healthy to mild cognitive impairment. Uh, why is this important? Because if we can pick them up when they are just mildly cognitively impaired, it means that the situation can be reversed. They can go back to cognitively healthy. If you don't pick them up at the mild cognitive impairment level, this will degrade into dementia. And when it gets to dementia, it becomes irreversible. Um, so this project, again, has its challenges. 
uh, most of the challenges come from budget. So we were given very tight budget. We want to monitor 70 seniors in a period of 14 months. So we have to install the sensors for two months, remove the sensors, and then deploy them into another 10 seniors. So we have blocks of 10 seniors, so total of 70 seniors over 14 months. Um, so the constraints are that, um, of course, the sensors do not require interaction from the seniors. We just deploy them, and the seniors just go about their daily lives. Um, and we, are, we were on a very tight budget constraint, which gave rise to a lot of problems later on the ground. Uh, so within that two month period, we must ensure that our system is reliable enough to give the clinician one month of good usable data. Uh, we must minimize the maintenance visits, of course, and short interval between blocks for bug fixes. So with each block of 10 that we deploy, there's always some bugs that we bring back, and we can't have a lot of time to fix them because we, are, we only have 14 months and there's no buffer. Um, so this is our initial configuration. Uh, it looks very messy. Again, this is because of tight budget constraint. Uh, we have to work with several vendor systems and we have to find some ways of introducing an additional gateway. Uh, this one was primarily needed primarily because of the Microsoft Bank. As with most wearables, um, the wearables don't, com don't communicate directly with the Raspberry Pi gateway. So there's always a need for an Android phone. And because of budget constraints, we ended up buying a Samsung J1, which I don't recommend you use in your projects because it's really terrible. Uh, so some challenges are the following, with the mostly associated with the Samsung J1, uh, but I'm not against Samsung, by the way. Uh, so there are memory issues. Uh, there are these power saving settings. Uh, intermediate data collected and slow performance. So in our first two blocks, so this is currently in block four out of seven. In the first two blocks, we experienced huge problems with the Microsoft, with the Android phone. Uh, so these are some of the issues. And these are other technical issues. For instance, uh, our gateway couldn't talk to the vendor's router, which uses Wi-Fi. Uh, we had to eventually book the phone because we had to kill some useless applications from running and stop it from killing our applications. Uh, and there were some maintenance and deployment issues, especially in first two blocks. We had to make so many maintenance visits, uh, you would believe the amount of manpower costs incurred in this project. Uh, so this is version 4. So as you can see, we evolved from version 0 to version 4. And this is our current configuration for this project. I wouldn't say that we're bug free, there are still bugs in this uh, system, um, but we do have a tight budget constraint. Um, but we did, so this just to show you that uh, in terms of maintenance visits, comparing block one to two, um, because of the system fixes, we were able to reduce the need for maintenance, but there is still maintenance needed. System uptime has also improved, but you can see it was only at 60%, so still far from my view but it was less than 40% in block one. So you can imagine, after two months data, it was still very difficult for us to get one month of good data. Uh, so this is where we are. So this is the map of Singapore. Uh, we're very small. Uh, this is the, type, the number of deployments that we have in, done in Singapore uh, across different housing estates. Uh, this is the total number of seniors that we are monitoring to various projects. Um, so the previous slide is just to show you, even for a very small country, we have a very small team with only, with only two engineers supporting 170 deployments. So each time a system failure happens, something somebody has to schedule a visit, somebody has to go to the ground. This is um, highly expensive to deploy my engineers to do something like this. Um, therefore, um, and the, the first two vendor systems had limited monitoring that kind of um, created problems for us. So we are we moved to a unified system on monitoring system that uh, at least allows us to do proactive monitoring. So we don't wait until failures happen. We try and see whether we can pick up uh, faults before they happen. Uh, and 
and um, the other thing about ensuring the scalability and sustainability of our project. So this goes beyond technology. Uh, there are two aspects of our project that are important to make this scalable nationwide. Um, so one is we need people in the community to do two things. Uh, we need them to, uh, to be our ad hoc technicians. So they live in the vicinity of the seniors. If time of fault happens, we can trigger them and they can go down, take a visit, and fix simple fault. Sometimes it's just a matter of replacing batteries. Sometimes it's a matter of turning on and off. So doing a simple reset that you cannot expect the seniors to do themselves. Um, and the other important aspect is if these guys can already be our ad hoc technical crew, why not, or go, why not also leverage on them, uh, train them on care, so that when they visit the seniors, they don't just replace batteries, or they don't just work with the system, they take the time to also interact with seniors and to be our sniffers on the ground to collect information. So this, these kind of partnerships are important for this system to be truly scalable and sustainable. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, so what's important is that when we develop this particular system, we have to, as we learn later on, um, different aspects of the system, we have to look at the various stakeholders and be able to identify which feature of the system matters most to which particular stakeholder. Uh, this is important because, of course, um, since I'm the lead PM for this project, when I have to answer to government stakeholders, then I will pitch my presentations differently because different things matter to them. But ultimately, what matters here is that you need to look at what each of the stakeholders need uh, in this to make this uh, sustainable and usable. And uh, hopefully, at the end of this project, we are able to have uh, seniors like that. So these are actually participants in our study, five of them. Uh, some of them are smiling, which is good. <laughs> some of them are a bit skeptical. So hopefully, they can turn from skeptical to a smiling face. And thank you for your attention. Okay, um, we have some time for questions. James with an envelope. It was a very nice talk. Thank you very much. The, um, my question is about the, the rules and the construction of the rules. Do you uh, use a particular um, uh, uh, protocol for that? Do you use if then then that rules, or or what? Or do you make something up yourself? So. Um, the rules are actually determined by the caregivers. So we implement the rules that they, they would design. So they would say, for these 15 seniors, the first five, they are more severe, the rules will be such, and the next five will be such, and we just implement them. Does that answer your question? In what, in, in what language do you write the rules? Right now, we write the rules in Python. So uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, you mentioned concerns about privacy. Now, when it comes to situations like this, it is possible that you know a certain elderly person is not willing to share information, but if there is any emergency, maybe the person is willing. So. What I'm asking you is, is there some customization that the elderly people can themselves uh, do uh, with respect to how you handle their information and how they are treated? So um, that's a good point. Is there a way to customize the, the system according to the level of privacy that each senior expects? Yes. So can they give you feedback about how to handle so I would say that uh, this particular question is probably more relevant to the middle class and above, where the seniors themselves uh, are potentially the consumers of the information. So in our case, the seniors do not consume the information. So the information is consumed only by the caregivers. So as far as the seniors are concerned, uh, for them, 
of course, when we get the consent to participate in the project, we show them what we see to assure them that uh, we don't know when they are changing or the bathing or, or getting a shower. So in that regard, we don't have this issue that we will probably have to deal with uh, if the seniors are middle income and above. The questions. this question we've been asked a million times <laughs> so I should have said that what the solution does is we monitor inferred non medication so we know for sure that if they don't open the box that they didn't take the medication um, we do have seniors as you've described who are playful so they will beat the system they will open the box many times so we do have those situations so it's more right for me to say that we monitor in third non medication Oh, I have one. Um, okay, so um, you, you actually showed some really interesting data where you were saying the duration of being in the bathroom was increasing, and you said the caregivers did not know what to do with the information. I think it's actually a very clear point in that, and, and they should actually look into that, right? Because staying in the bathroom a long time might actually be a sign of some kind of an illness starting. So I think it would be helpful um, to be looked at some of that data. You know, maybe it could be a preventive care of an upcoming illness or something like that, right? So I think that would be, um, you know, per perhaps would be part of your preventive um, care. Um, you are definitely right. So we, we make the same assumption that they would do something about it. They want to do something about it, they just don't know how to go about it. Uh, mainly because they are also not healthcare professionals. Uh, but for this project, we are starting to engage clinicians. Uh, for instance, we are starting to monitor uh, elderly gentlemen's bathroom behavior, and we're going to present them to urologists and try to see whether there is a link between a large prostate and uh, bathroom behavior. So I think that is when they will know what to do. All right, thank you very much. Um, as the keynote speaker of the SENSAT workshop, of course, um, my question to you would be, what implications do you see in the sensor networking community or in the sensing community in general? What, what open research challenges are there still? Would you say it's sufficient to just find two engineers that combine Z-wave sensors? Or would you rather say there's still a gap in, in terms of research that some of us could probably fill. I think before I had to deal with um, sensors that interact with people, um, my main answer would be we just need two very clever engineers. Uh, we use deploy sensors on lampposts. So we don't care about the lamppost emotions and you know whether they are accepted or not, because of whether there are privacy concerns. Um, but now I think when you need to deal with human beings, uh, it's probably import equally important to have a social behavioral uh, researcher working together with your technologies. Um, if you want your human subjects to use uh, and accept your system, I think it's less of a technological or engineering uh, research alone. Anymore. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first, uh, it might be a suggestion. We would suggest using a platform, a platform to improve uh, or to uh, extend the application uh, maintenance and uh, uh, analysis of configuration of such a system. It would help uh, locally and globally in uh, in separating or uh, maximizing the 
the use of such system and helping people uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, do you think it's applicable uh, to, uh, to use platforms to have people uh, uh, around the world helping to deploy such systems or uh, uh, providing the required maintenance and also uh, do you think it's a good uh, idea? Uh, I didn't quite get you are suggesting to use platforms. Platforms. Uh, yes. Platforms. Platforms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's a it's an appropriate idea because the platforms are used used uh, widely today? Um, I need to understand what you mean by platforms. Platforms. Uh, like Uber, it is a platform. Uh, uh, platform. It's a. Um, uh, uh, a system where uh, users uh, are playing different roles uh, uh, and providing services. So it's like it's, uh, like Amazon, it's like Uber, like uh, all those are considered uh, as platforms. Yeah. I'm not hundred percent sure. I understand what you mean. I do refer to open sharing, uh, sharing, economy, yeah. sharing economy platforms. Or maybe we can talk offline. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I've got uh, one last question. Uh, you mentioned, uh, at, at least with this one, uh, that uh, you have uh, some people that go in and install the system, and then the users, don't, the patients don't have to do anything. And you talked about scalability and gave some ideas. In the future, do you see a, a place where maybe the users of the system, they actually install it, not engineers? Um, do you see that as that, that has to happen for scalability? Certainly for certain applications, may not, maybe not all. Um, definitely for scalability. In fact, um, we are trying to develop a deployment tool that is intended for our research assistants to use them. So right now, our engineers deploy the systems. Um, if the tool is, is successful in enabling our research assistants to deploy the sensors, then I think we're moving in the correct step towards eventually the seniors themselves being able to plug and play the systems themselves. I think that's it. Unless there are any other questions, let's go ahead and thank this uh, keynote speaker again. Thank you very much.